Hi there, Mindsetters, and welcome to our spring school revision session. And today we're going to be taking a look at chemical industries. Now, chemical industries may only be around about 25% of your finals or your prelim if you still have to write it, but chemical industries is where you really get to test your knowledge about all of the other chemical change that you've done. You might have noticed that this year was roughly broken up into three pieces when you dealt with chemistry. The first one was dealing with matter and materials, and that was your organic. Now, organic is really important, and it's one of the sections that you should get a lot of time to. But the entire rest of chemistry, which is chemical change and chemical systems together, deals with um, your redox, your rates, your equilibrium, all of that stuff, all gets tied together in the section which we're going to cover today. And that is to do with chemical industries. Now, chemical industries is one of my favorite sections inside this. I know I say that about a lot of these things, but it really tests your knowledge of how you've dealt with chemical change, if you know your redox or not, your electrochemistry, your rates, your equilibrium. It's a really good place to start if you're hoping to see whether or not your preparation has been good. Now, I wouldn't start with chemical industries when I'm studying. A lot of you might say, okay, chemistry is all about the studying and we just have to learn things off by heart and there's some labels that I'm gonna learn. But guys, that's a wrong approach to take. So what I'm going to do today is I'm gonna give you a few tips and we're gonna jump straight into some of those past paper questions and see what some of the common types of questions might be. Now, just to lay it all out for you, I'm gonna draw just a quick mind map and I want you to do the same at home about what chemical industries is all about. So, Guys, chemical industries is broken up into several pieces. And you might notice that we're gonna deal with some sections which deal with the fertilizer industry and talking about how to do all of those. Now, if you spell fertilizers with an S, you're my friend because Z is an American smelling of it. And chloralkali is a very important one because we focus on that quite a bit. Chloralkali is an incredibly important part of chemical industries because chloralkali is a reliable, it's gonna be asked every single time. And then last but not least, definitely batteries. Guys, batteries is one of those new sections which uh, you guys have gotta know very well because batteries has gotta be asked. The nice thing about that is that all of these chemistry, uh, chemical industries questions are relatively predictable as long as you guys prepare very well. So let's see how we go about before we even start with chemical industries. Now, there's some very important skills that you'll need in this section before you even get start, started with chemical industries. And here we go. Now, this first one might make some of you cringe, and that's a sign that you need to go back and do a little bit of revision. You need to find and use redox reactions on the table of half reductions. Okay, now, this reduction, um, sorry, this reduction potentials table is absolutely important for you guys to know. So it's called by a number of names. Some people just call it the redox table. Guys, you've got to know your reduction potentials table and how to use it specifically before we move on with any of this. And then, guys, this is where it all comes into play. Whether or not it's chloralkali or batteries, you've got to know and apply the principles of electrochemistry. So you need to know what an anode and a cathode are. You need to be able to calculate cell potential. You need to be able to tell me if it's endo or exothermic. Guys, this is all background and you should know all of this before you even get started with chemical industries. Let's follow on with some of the other knowledge that I need to know from chemical change. Now, the next one is something that people really struggle with. And this is quite important. Now, you need to know all about equilibrium, guys, because chemical industries is all about chemical processes and doing them in large industrial scale. Now, a lot of those chemical reactions take place at equilibrium. So it's quite important that you notice that equilibrium is a vital part. And then, guys, a lot of people neglect this, and that is rates of reactions. And rates of reactions is really important because rates of reactions is all talking about chemical industries and how quickly we can produce chemicals. Now just a reminder that chemical industries are trying to produce as much as possible and rates of reactions is obviously very important because guys, equilibrium and the balance taking place inside those massive reaction vessels wouldn't be anything without understanding the rates behind them. So I know to go and revise my redox, my equilibrium and my rates of reactions and then now this is a part that a lot of people forget. Guys, 
you have to know the basic knowledge here. Now, this is the learning work. This is the stuff which I recommend that you put down in a mind map and actually go do the hard study work for. You need to know the product's names. Now, you might say, okay, well, uh, that's the Ostwald process, or that's the Harbor process, or that's chloralkali. Guys, you've got to know what we're trying to go after. What are we actually trying to produce? And that's really important. Guys, you have to know the product's names, their formulae. Because very often it's a question about what is the formula of this particular thing. And then, this is also really important because they always ask this, their uses in society. Guys, their uses in society are absolutely vital because, um, you know, we're making these things for a reason and people are going to be selling these. Guys, it's impossible to actually make a chemical and not sell it because we're in it for the money and so are chemical industries and guys you've got to help them make a little bit more money so if you tell yourself a story of I'm the plant manager and I'd like to make a little bit more money how am I going to do this but what am I producing what am I selling guys you have to sell this section to your examiners and you've got to know what you're talking about so let's jump straight into it I'm gonna jump into at least uh, three or four questions today we're gonna to get through tr as much as we can we're going to deal with the major chemical industries and we're going to see how you go about uh, using a redox table or dealing with a rates question or equilibrium question. Let's get into it. Okay, so starting with our question one, this is from uh, the February and March 2012. Now, just a little bit of a hint, guys. The March and February papers seem to be a little bit more challenging. Now, the level of their papers, the breakdown is exactly the same, but the March-February papers seem to be the ones with a slightly more challenging twist. So if you're looking for a little bit of difficulty and a little bit of extra challenge, go for those February-March papers because they seem to have the extra edge on the other papers. Now, this was uh, question 10 in that particular paper. And guys, you can get these papers online for free. So if you're looking for a little bit of backup and the memos, you can follow, um, follow our show. And uh, you can actually take a look through these questions yourself. Okay, so now I've got a simplified diagram in front of me of a cell which is used inside the chloralkali process. Okay, so now your first hint should be saying, okay, well, this is the chloralkali industry. Now, I don't like it when people just say, I've got to learn this section off by heart. It makes no sense to say, oh, that's the chloralkali industry. What does that actually mean? Well, it must mean something to do with chlorine and an alkali which I'm producing. Guys, take the words apart. It's going to make your life a little bit easier. Now, I've got the cell in front of me. So let's take a look at some of the details. Now, I've got a few gases which are coming out here, and we're going to start dealing with it. And we've got some brine and some water and some used salt solution. Okay. Now this question that I'm going to ask you now, question 1.1 is probably the most important and most commonly asked questions inside the chloroalkali process. It says, write down, now remember what I said, you've got to memorize these, the chemical formula for brine. Now lots of you are saying, oh okay, I know exactly what that is, it's salt, or it's uh, NaCl, or it's sodium chloride, whatever. Which one do I write down? Guys, please follow the instructions. Because if I don't write down the chemical formula, I'm not going to get any marks. And you don't actually deserve them because you haven't followed the question. So let's answer the question. It says write down the chemical formula for brine. Now, on our diagram, it says that brine is up there on the left, and it's what goes into my process. This is called my chemical feedstock. Now, feedstock is a chemical which I actually feed into my machine, and that's what I use to make my chemicals. So I've got to write down the chemical formula for brine. Now, I'm hoping at home you're saying, ah, I know exactly what brine is. Brine is sodium chloride, but I can't write down sodium chloride. I need a chemical formula. So the chemical formula is NaCl, but that's not enough, guys. NaCl is table salt. It's sodium chloride. But brine is a solution. So you've got to say NaCl. Now, to indicate that it's in a solution, I want you to put the letters AQ. AQ stands for aqueous, which in Latin means that it's filled up with water. So this is NaCl in water. Now that is the chemical formula. If you've written down sodium chloride, you're wrong, guys. NaCl AQ is the chemical formula for brine. Moving onwards, okay, now this is the part which I particularly like. It says, at which electrode, X or Y, X or Y is chlorine gas formed? Okay. Now, we're not sure what's actually going on here. We know that the diagram has got a few gases coming out the top, but let's find X and Y. Okay, so now what I've got here is my electrodes, which are electrodes X and electrode Y. 
how on earth am I going to go about figuring out what's going on in this question and which electrode these gases are going into? A lot of you will say, well, you know, look for the correct electrode. Okay, now let's just stop for a second and let's see what's going in with brine. Just a reminder that brine is a mixture of H2O, there's some sodium ions, which are going inside there, and there's some Cl- ions. Okay, now it's very important that you uh, take a look and see what's actually going on here. Where do I produce the sodium hydroxide? Okay, now this is a little bit of a tip. When you go down to your redox table, and I've actually taken a redox table here, and um, I'm, I'm going to give you a little bit of a tip when you're looking at this redox table. Now your redox table is going to look a little bit like this and I'm even going to draw in the same arrows which you've got. Guys, you've got an arrow on the left hand side here where you've got to choose the most reactive and then the most reactive on the right. So I've got an arrow which points left, down, right, up. Okay, and that helps me choose the most reactive species. But that's not what we're going to do now. What I'm going to do is I'm going to ask you to find the correct reactions. We're going to come back to them in a moment. Now I've done it twice for two different sections of the, the table. I've separated them out, so I'm just going to redraw the, these arrows because they're the same arrows everywhere on the table and I've just taken two portions out of your redox table to illustrate some points. Now I want you to take a look at the one reaction right up at the top. Here we go. So we got the one reaction, we're all the way up at the top here. Okay, now that reaction I particularly like, and this is the way that I remember this, is because it produces two of the products which I'm particularly interested in. It produces H2 and it produces my hydroxide ions. Now those two things are products which come out of the chloralkali industry. Now guys, this is one of the ways that I know that I've got the correct reaction. And it's also a little bit of a hint when I look at my diagram. Now when I look up at my diagram, I say, okay, well, NaOH is coming out somewhere. That's got my OH ions over there on the right-hand side. That is where my OH ions are coming out. Hmm, that should get me thinking. That means that the gas which is going to come out here is going to be hydrogen because hydrogen and the OH ions are produced in the same cell. Now that's a little bit of an indicator that at electrode Y, which is the other one, that's where chlorine is going to be produced. Okay, so let me run you through that reasoning again. The hydroxide ions, and there it is, the hydroxide ions and the hydrogen gas are produced in the same cell. They're always produced in the same cell. It doesn't matter which one of the three types of cells you've got in front of you, I know that H2 and OH- are going to be produced in the same cell. In the other cell, I'm going to be producing some chlorine. Now, here's another hint. Chlorine is usually produced in the first place where brine enters. And for that very reason, Y must be a positive electrode because it's got to attract the Cl-. Okay, so chlorine is usually produced in the first cell. Now, that means that it's going to be produced in the electrode compartment that it goes into first. And there's a third clue that I've chosen the correct idea over here. Now, I'm not expecting you to go through all three. I want you to see over here in the middle there, there's a separator. That might be a membrane or a diaphragm. But the chances are we want to keep chlorine ions from going through there. That might come up a little bit later. Okay, so we've decided that electrode Y is where this gas is formed. So Y is definitely the compartment where it's formed. It's only for one mark. There we go. So we've got our first two marks. Okay, so 1.3. Remember what I said. Write down a half reaction that explains the formation of hydrogen at one of the electrodes. Now, if you are entirely familiar with this process, guys, this is unforgivable if you cannot write down this reaction. There's a couple of hints to get the correct reaction. It's absolutely vital that you get it down perfectly as you see on the table. Let's go back to our redox table and let's see which reaction we're dealing with. Okay, so I've got a reaction over here and this is a reaction which we're going to concentrate on and it's right up at the top there. There we go. It's right up at the top there and that is the reaction which is going to be producing hydrogen. Okay, so I'm producing hydrogen and hydroxide ions with the addition of two electrodes. Now you might notice that on this particular one, this is a reversible reaction. 
When you write it down, you're going to have one single error. So let's do exactly that. So 2H2O plus 2 electrons goes to form H2 plus OH minus. But how do I know which, which side to start off from? Now, it might seem a little bit obvious to some of you, but for some of you are saying, oh, well, I don't know if I should start at the left or start at the right. Guys, start with the stuff that you actually have, and that's H2O. H2O is something which I put on. I've got H2O. I'm trying to make the hydrogen. I'm trying to make the hydroxide ions. So let's write that down. So they are looking for this half reaction. Now it says that H2O goes in there. Now I've missed out something there. Make sure that you've got two H2Os plus two electrons. And now please make sure that you only put in one side arrow. Okay, it's a single direction because we're asking the reaction to go in one direction only. And that is going to make us our lovely hydrogen gas, which is the fuel of the future, plus some OH minus, which is useful for making some soaps. Okay, but there we go. All we've got to do is copy it out, guys. There couldn't be easier marks as long as you know which one to choose. Now, I just wanted to show you something else on the table, and it's a common mistake among the matrix. They choose the incorrect formula. They say, oh, there's another reaction which makes hydrogen. There's another reaction there that makes hydrogen. Maybe that's the one. Guys, please be very careful about this one. Firstly, yes, it looks like H plus is a more reactive ion. And it is. Look at the arrow on the left. But you don't have H plus, guys. You do not have hydrogen plus ions because the solution is not acidic. Okay, so please be very careful. We know that there's lots of OH minus ions. It's going to make it very alkaline, and that's the reason why this is called the chlor alkali process. Let's continue with our question. Okay, now this I particularly like because they're asking us application questions. Application questions really get down to the core of our understanding of this particular process. It says, the purity of the sodium hydroxide produced in the chlor alkali industry depends on the extent to which it is separated. Now, separated means that I'm taking it away from something else. Separated from the chlorine gas produced by the cell. Briefly described how chlorine gas and sodium hydroxide are prevented from mixing in the cell. Okay, now to do that, I've got to have the cell on the picture in front of me. Now, remember what I said, that chlorine and the sodium hydroxide are actually produced in different compartments or different parts of the cell. I've got two half cells. Now chlorine, which is produced in the first compartment, is kept separate. Now there's a few reasons for this. Chlorine is very reactive. So chlorine has to be kept away from the other chemicals. Now particularly hydroxide, which is produced in the other side. So they're actually produced in separate tanks. There's a separator over here. This separator is either an asbestos diaphragm or it's a membrane. But I know from the structure of this that this is a membrane. Now the reason that I know that is because a diaphragm cell usually only has one inlet and one outlet for the chemicals which are liquid. You might notice that there was a section that said a used salt solution. Now, this is very important, that if I've got brine in, used salt solution out, guys, that's a hint that you're dealing with a membrane cell. Now, membrane cells are very, very special. These membranes can stop the chloride ions. They stop all the negative ions from moving across. They're so picky, they even stop water. The only thing which they allow to go across is the sodium ions. So what they allow is sodium ions to pass over here. This is said to be an ion selective mem membrane or a selectively permeable membrane. Now it's not the same as a semi-permeable. A selectively permeable membrane only lets through one particular ion. So that's really important. So it only lets through the positive ions. Now how it does that, you can read online. It's something to do with, uh, there's a very big polymer support and there's a lot of complicated chemistry and a lot of benzene rings that are negatively charged that hold onto my sodium ions. If you're interested, you can go read online, read in your textbooks. It might explain it to you. But what you've got to know about membranes is that they only allow sodium ions to pass through them. Now why is that important? Well, it doesn't let any of the chlorine through. 
we want to keep the chlorine away from the hydroxide. If you want to know why, well, chlorine mixed with hydroxide actually makes bleach. And that's not what we're after initially. Bleach is a very important industrial product. In fact, they mix some of the chlorine back with the sodium hydroxide later on to make the bleaches that we use in our washing or to disinfect our homes. Now, the other chemical that you don't want uh, mixing with chlorine is hydrogen. Those two make an explosive mixture. In fact, it's a really strange explosive mixture that actually gets set off by UV light. So if you put hydrogen and chlorine together inside sunlight, they actually explode. So that's really dangerous. Okay, so 1.5. Okay, now here is one of the things where you've got to know the specifics of your cell. It says, apart from the advantages and disadvantages of products produced, write down for this process. Now it says the one positive impact on humans. Okay, well guys, this is a very open-ended question. You've got to get a positive impact. Now here's some of the hints. Please be specific. If you just say it's good for humans, yes, I know it's good for humans. Food is good for humans. Water is good for humans. But we're trying to get something very specific here. So I say one positive impact on humans. Hmm. Well, let's get something like, oh, perhaps hydrogen is an excellent fuel. So we can say that hydrogen is a good fuel. Okay, so that tells me where I can use this. Okay, so when I say that this is an excellent fuel, that tells me that I can burn hydrogen to make energy. That's great. What about chlorine? Cl2 is a good disinfectant. Okay, or it's a good bleaching agent even. So I know that Cl2 is used for bleaching pools and for bleaching clothes and all sorts of things. So H2 is good for fuel. Cl okay, now this is where you really need to know your uses because you can say, ah, oh, chloroalkali industry is really good for us because hydrogen is great for fuel. It's great for making all sorts of things like even margarine. Uh, what about Cl2? Oh, that's a good bleach and it's good for pool chemicals. Okay, please be specific. Avoid words like it's good for us or it's healthy or it's beneficial. Say in which way. If you're too vague, we can't give you marks, guys, when we mark your papers at the end of the year. Okay, now what about negative impacts on humans? Okay, well, guys, all of these chemicals are really useful, but they can be used for very bad things. Now, what about hydrogen is explosive? So we can say that hydrogen is explosive. Now, they only asked for one, but let me give you some other ideas. Please avoid words like, oh, it's bad for us, or it has a negative impact. Guys, you're just repeating the question. What about Cl2? Guys, chlorine is very infamous because chlorine was one of the first gases to be used on humans in World War I. Okay, so Cl2 is very toxic. So we can say that it's very toxic. So we're saying that this stuff is very bad for us. And guys, it's really, really nasty stuff. Don't ever get some chlorine gas around you. OK, so that was it for our chloroalkali question. What I'm going to do before we take a short break, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through question two, which is a little bit shorter. One of the things that I like to do is I like to give my learners revision questions which involve mind maps and flow charts. You are going to get a question like this in your finals. It's guaranteed. There's always going to be flowcharts. You have to identify the part. To do that, you have to know your sections very well. And this particular question was from the November 2012. So this is last year's final paper. This is from the question 11. It says the flow diagram below represents processes used inside the fertilizer industry. Notice how they're using an S. So they're my friends. Okay, so we start off with some air, some really good stuff. Air, which is composed of nitrogen and oxygen mostly, a little bit of water and some carbon dioxide. It gets separated out, and through process X, I get really pure nitrogen, so it separates it out. Now, using hydrogen potentially from our chloroalkali process, so we could have H2 coming in there. H2 and N2 go using process Y to make ammonia. Now, guys, you've got another formula for these things. Ammonia is a product of one of your processes, and they're going to ask us what it is. So ammonia is NH3. Notice how you can piece this together if you know the parts that go into this. Now, that ammonia is very, very useful stuff. I use process Z over there to make some sort of acid, R, 
and combined with acid R, I get ammonium sulfate. Now, I'm hoping that you know the formula for ammonium sulfate. So it's NH42SO4. Now, you have to know the formula for all of these particular salts. That's a really important fertilizer, especially if you want to make your soil a little bit acidic. Depends on your crops. Okay, now this is a very knowledge-based question. It says, write down the name of industrial process X. So let's look at our photo diagram and let's see where process X comes in. Process X is a process where I take air, which I'm breathing in right now, or at least I hope you are as well. Okay, so process X is air. So it's a mixture of nitrogen and oxygen. How do you get those two separate from each other? Now that process is called fractional distillation. So now it's a little bit of a tongue twister. So fractional, so that means that it's divided up into its fractions. So fractional distillation. Now, it's worthwhile just talking about what fractional distillation is. Oxygen and nitrogen are cooled down until they're liquids. Then you warm them up, and what you'll actually find is that nitrogen boils off first and leaves behind oxygen. Oxygen has got a much higher boiling point because it's a heavier gas. I wonder if you can tell me why. Okay, but now they're asking for a balanced equation for process Y. So let's see what process Y is all about. Process Y is so easy guys because look I've even written down the chemicals which go into it I can see that there's nitrogen and there's hydrogen and my ammonia is my product so process Y is a combination of nitrogen plus hydrogen to go to give me NH3 notice how easy this is if I know the formulas of the things which are going in so I've got nitrogen I mix it with a bit of hydrogen now, this particular process you need to know is reversible. This is an equilibrium process, and that's where the questions are going. Then NH3 is my product. Just a reminder that all three of these are gases, so it's quite important that we put in our phase indicators. All three are gases. Now, please, don't forget the last step, and I've got to balance this. Okay, well, my nitrogen has got to be balanced. There's two on either side. There's six hydrogens on the right, so there has to be six on the left and that's my balanced equation if you really want to be fancy you can go and put a catalyst on top of this and the catalyst over there is platinum so there we have it question two was dealing with some of these now please I can't emphasize this enough please make sure that you know all of your names your processes and all of the steps that go inside them if you don't know your redox guys brush up on it make sure that you know how to do redox rates and equilibrium we're going to take a short break and we'll be right back with you. Welcome back guys. I hope you enjoyed our first segment of our spring school revision session. We're going to get straight back into the questions. We're dealing with some more chemical industries if you've just joined us. And we're dealing with some past paper questions, specifically talking about your chloralkali, your fertilizer, or your battery industry. And I want to get into some more of those. Okay, so now question three for uh, this revision session. We're going to be dealing with a little bit more of that chemical industries. What I've decided to do was to take one of those February or March papers. And guys, this is from the most recent one, and that was the February, March 2013 paper. This was question 11. You might notice that chemical industries is right at the back of the paper because it's after you've done your matter and materials. It's after you've done your chemical change and all of that. Okay. So guys, we're dealing with different processes again. And what did I tell you before the break? Guys, another flow diagram. You guys have to know your flow diagrams. So practice them, draw your own, make your own summaries, practice the names, the formulas, get absolutely, completely on board with these. Okay, so we've got these different processes on this. And we start talking about fertilizers C and F. Now, every time you're reading through a passage, I want you to highlight what you're doing. So I've got fertilizers C and F. Let's find them on my flow diagram. I see fertilizer C over there and fertilizer F over there. So I can see that I'm making these two fertilizers which are presented in this diagram. Okay, now let's just try and figure out what's going on on a flow diagram. I've got some air up here, which is uh, one of the most abundant things that I can do. All I have to do is <gasps> Take a nice deep breath and I've got a whole bunch of air, which is a mixture of nitrogen and oxygen. Nitrogen and oxygen, pretty important stuff. 
it turns into gas A, but gas A is going to go into making ammonia. Now, ammonia is one of the very important products, and that's NH3. And natural gas, mm, now this is a difficult one, because natural gas is one of the carbon feedstocks that are used with water to make hydrogen. Now, that was a bit of a difficult one, but not, if you can figure out this part of the puzzle piece, what gas A is. Gas A is nitrogen from air. I know that N2 and H2 go together to give me ammonia. So if you know your harbor process very well, that's really not too difficult. Now, if I subject my ammonia to some oxygen, probably from the air again, it turns into gas D. Oxygen, oh, okay, again into S, uh, gas E. Um, so gas D over there. Hmm, now that's quite interesting. I need to know what the products are. So gas D is, oh, that's a little bit difficult. I don't know what's going on here. Guys, gas D is the first step inside the Ospold process. Gas E is the second step where I make NO2. Guys, you've got to know this. This really is not too difficult. Okay, so ammonia, which I can use, um, I can oxidize it into NO and NO2. Guys, you've got to know these as, a pro uh, as products of the Oswald process, those steps. Eventually, I can actually change NO2 back into nitric acid. Guys, anytime you see a name, write down a formula because that helps me fill in my, my puzzle here. That's HNO3. Sulfuric acid I see on there. We dealt with that before the break, and that was H2SO4. Okay, notice how I've got all of the pieces of my chemical puzzle. Let's answer some questions. It says, write down the name or formula of gas A. Oh, that's not too difficult. What am I interested in when I'm making ammonia while I need nitrogen and hydrogen? Which one out of those two can I get from the air around me and inside my lungs. Which one of those is actually very common? And that's actually nitrogen. So there we go, gas A is nitrogen. So it says the name or the formula. So they're being very kind to us. So you can say the name, which is nitrogen. So nitrogen, okay? Or if you wanna be lazy like me, N2. Okay, 3.1.2, it says gas B. Now this was a difficult one because a lot of you don't actually know where hydrogen comes from if it doesn't come from the chloroalkali process. But I can play detective, I can say nitrogen plus something goes to make ammonia. Ah, that must be nitrogen and ah, hydrogen. There we go. Hydrogen is the other gas which I need and that's what I make from natural gas. Okay, so there we go, gas B, that is hydrogen. Those are the two chemicals which I need to make ammonia. So hydrogen, which is H2. Notice how many marks I'm just getting from knowing my work. Fertilizer F, ooh, now this is a little bit of a challenge. So if we go and take a look, fertilizer F, let's see what goes into fertilizer F. So fertilizer F is over here. What goes into fertilizer F? NH3 goes into fertilizer F, and so does nitric acid. I've taken two of those formulas now, let's combine them into one. Fertilizer F, now I'm going to show you how to do this. They don't ask us to do this, but I actually want to show you how to do it. Fertilizer F has got to be ammonium nitrate. And the way that I know that is because ammonia, NH3, plus nitric acid, so HNO3. Then -da, this really isn't difficult. Ammonia plus nitric acid goes to make ammonium nitrate. So there we go, NH4, NO3. That very useful stuff. Ammonium nitrate is an excellent fertilizer. It's also used inside the mines uh, to blow up rock so we can get minerals out of there. Okay, it's an excellent explosive for that. Okay, so guys, be absolutely sure that you, just make sure that the examiner knows that you're not just writing down formulae. This is my final answer. That is NH4, NO3. That's ammonium nitrate. That is my fertilizer F. Okay. So if you want the name of that, guys, this is ammonium. So different from ammonia. So it's ammonium because it's NH4. Ammonium nitrate because it was made from nitric acid. Okay, let's carry on with question three. Let's see what else they can ask us about our process. Okay, now it says sulfuric acid is used to prepare fertilizer C. So now that we've got a nice clean diagram, let's just write in what we had. Fertilizer C came from sulfuric acid which was H2SO4. Ah, and ammonia. This really isn't too tough now. I know ammonia plus sulfuric acid. Guys, what could it be 
when they ask us for the name of the industrial process to prepare sulfuric acid. Well, this is really easy. Guys, sulfuric acid is made by the contact process. There's no thinking involved there. All we've got to say is, ah, oh, right, I know that the contact process produces sulfuric acid. So that is the contact process. Now you might say, well, how did he get it so quickly? Guys, I've been doing this for almost uh, 10 years now. I know that the contact process is what makes sulfuric acid. There's no, ways to, uh, no two ways about it. I've got to know my work. I've got to know exactly which process makes which product. And then, this is where things get interesting. I want a balanced equation for the preparation of fertilizer C. Okay, so now what went into fertilizer C? Let's highlight it. Let's circle it on my diagram. I had H2SO4. I had ammonia. So this is why I say anytime you get a flow diagram where you see names, put down the formulas. If you put down the formulas, those are the keys, that's the chemical language that you need to use. So sulfuric acid, H2SO4, or ammonia, NH3, they're going in to make fertilizer C. So let's try and figure out what the formula is for fertilizer C and let's actually put in the, the reactants that we need. So the acid which went in, the sulfuric acid from the contact process, that was H2SO4. Fantastic. What else went in there? I saw some ammonia, which was creeping its way in there. And there was a reaction that took place. Ah, wait a minute. We did this before the break. This seems to be a common question. And you'll notice the more past papers you do, this happens quite often. So here we go. So we've got H2SO4 and we've got uh, NH3 as our base. This is an acid-base reaction. So that becomes NH4, which is the ammonium ion because it's accepted some hydrogen from the sulfur, uh, sorry, from the sulfate. And then, just a reminder that sulfate is greedy. It's divalent. It grabs onto two ammonium ions. So that means that I need to balance out my NH3. And there we have it, a balanced equation for this. All I needed to do was remember the names and formulas of those products and I could follow my flow diagram. Even if I'd forgotten some or didn't know all of them, I could piece it together like a puzzle. So here we go. Let's finish off this question. Let's see what's in store here. Now we've got our flow diagram. Now this is where we're starting to get really interesting. It says gases D and E are prepared during the Ostwald process. Surprise, surprise, but we already knew that. The Ostwald process. Okay, we already identified, now it says write down the given name for the preparation, sorry, the name given to the preparation of gas D from ammonia. Well, I need to know what gas D is first before I give the name. Okay, so I see a catalyst. Oh, and some oxygen. Now that's a bit of a hint. So I've got ammonia, which is NH3, plus oxygen goes to form gas D. Wait a minute. Oxygen, oxygen oxidized. Guys, I'm oxidizing ammonia with the use of a catalyst. So that's where we get the name from. I am catalytically, now that's a bit of a mouthful, so let me write it down for you. So this is called the catalytic. Okay, I'm using a catalyst, catalytic oxidation. So I'm using a catalyst to oxidize ammonia. I'm taking ammonia and I'm oxidizing it. Now they want a balanced equation for pr preparation of gas D. So gas D is NO. Now I'm going to show you a little bit of a problem. I know that there is ammonia which is NH3. I put in some oxygen. Surprise, surprise, the nitrogen, the oxygen get together to produce NO. What happens to the hydrogen? That's a bit of a mystery. Now, you've got oxygen, you've got hydrogen lying around. What do you think is going to happen? I'm going to get some water forming, but let's just prove it to you. Now, this one is a particularly tricky one to balance. Now, NH3 goes in there. Some oxygen, probably from the air, is going to join it. And this, using a catalyst, that's what I put on top of my arrow there, is going to catalytically oxidize my ammonia. Okay, so now let's write down my products. So I've got NO plus H2O. Okay, now here's where things get really tricky. I want to give you a few hints when you're trying to balance equations. Now, start with, the, uh, start with the elements which only appear once on either side. Now, that might not seem to make sense until I actually do this, so I'm going to demonstrate. 
So nitrogen only appears once on either side. So that's a good candidate to start balancing. Lucky for us, nitrogen is already balanced. What about hydrogen? So let's highlight hydrogen. Hydrogen is over there. Hydrogen is over there. Hydrogen is not balanced. Okay, so now I've got a problem on my hands. Okay, so I've got a balance two and three. Now when you've got problems of odds and evens, it's much easier to find a lowest common multiple. The lowest common multiple or the lowest number that both two and three go into is six. So to get six hydrogens out of ammonia, I need to have two of them, but we're not gonna stop there. You're gonna see where this is gonna come undone. And then I'm gonna have three of those. But a lot of you are saying, okay, well, I've just unbalanced the nitrogen, so let's balance those again. Okay, so everything seems to be okay. I've balanced the hydrogen, I've balanced the nitrogen, and I've balanced the nitrogen again. Everything looks fine until, until, and here's the problem. Oxygen is present in several places. I see it over there, and over there, and over there. Oh dear, now I've got a problem. It's very difficult to know where to add more oxygen, but I'm gonna show you some tricks. Okay, now it's quite clear that there's more oxygen on the right hand side. I can see one, two, three, four, five oxygens on the right hand side. Now there's no way that you can get five oxygens if you deliver them in pairs, like we have on the left hand side. That's impossible. You cannot deliver five oxygens if all you can supply is twos. So how do we do this? Well, let's get rid of the odd number. So one of the simplest ways that you can do this is to multiply everything which is making the odd number by two. And what you'll find is something a little bit better. Now just a reminder that everything else needed to multiply with it. Now what do we have? Let's count the oxygens again. So now I've got one, two, three, four oxygens. On the right hand side I no longer have one, two, three. I have one, two, three, one, two, three which makes six. Now I have ten oxygens on the right hand side. That I can supply. There we go. That's how you get 10 oxygens. Okay, really difficult one to balance. Really nice demonstration of how to do the balancing though. That is the catalytic oxidation of ammonia. Okay, so we've reached the last question of uh, tonight's revision session and I want to spend a little bit of time on this because this is one of the sections which is guaranteed, guys. We've dealt with some of the chemical processes for fertilizers. We have dealt with the chloroalkali industry. Only one left over is batteries. So batteries is a really important part of your syllabus. Now you've got to know the difference between primary cells and secondary cells, so we're going to spend some time on this one. Okay, so question four for tonight's revision is adapted from your uh, final from last year. It was question 10 right at the back of the paper again. It says the following half reactions take place when a non-rechargeable, okay that's quite key, it's quite important that they point out that this is non-rechargeable alkaline cell. Guys this is just like the pen light batteries that you find inside torches or anything which can't be recharged. Those little thin long batteries, those are non-rechargeable cells. You cannot charge them back up. Please don't try either. Okay, so there's two reactions over here. Now I see the first reaction over here. First reaction over here has got something really interesting. I see zinc on the left hand side. There it is. Plus 2H minus, so that's why it's called alkaline. It's got OH minus ions. And my products include electrons. Hmm, that's quite interesting. If electrons are on the right hand side of an equation, I hope that you know that this is oxidation. This is my oxidation half reaction because oxidation is about the loss of electrons. Remember oil rig. If you don't, let me tell you what these letters stand for. Okay, so we're going to do this like karaoke. Some of you are going to be able to do this with me. So oxidation is loss, reduction is gain of electrons. So over here in the first reaction, I saw the loss of electrons. Please don't be fooled by the plus electrons. Plus in a chemical reaction means and, not add, like it does in maths. So I'm producing something and I'm also producing electrons. They must have come from somewhere. I'm losing electrons if they're on the right hand side. Let's just see if the other reaction is maybe a reduction reaction. So let's pick a different color. So there we go. I've got MnO2, manganese dioxide or manganese 4 oxide. 
I've got two electrons which go inside there. Hmm. They're going into my reaction. That means reduction is taking place. Reduction is gain. So there we go. So reduction, half reaction. Now that's vital because if I know my oxidation and my reduction, I know which one is my anode and my cathode. Notice how redox is coming back to bite you if you don't know it properly. It says, write down the general name used for non-rechargeable batteries. Remember when I started talking about this section earlier? I told you that you would need to know the difference between primary and secondary cells. Primary cells, hmm, what does primary mean? Primary means one. So that means that you can only use a cell once. So this is a primary cell. A primary cell can only be used once. So that's quite easy. I know that this is a primary cell. Okay. Now which one of the above equations, equation one or equation two, represents the half reaction which takes place ah, at the cathode? And it says give a reason for your answer. Okay. So now I've got two marks to take care of. So one for identifying the reaction, which is at the cathode, and the other one for explaining myself. Okay, now you've got to ask yourself, well, what does a cathode really do? A cathode is where reduction takes place. And the way that I remember this is I remember a red cat. So if you write the word reduction and cathode next to each other, you'll actually see what I'm talking about. Reduction, so that's a red cat so red cat now this this is just a, a shortcut to remember that reduction always takes place at the cathode so a cathode is where reduction is taking place and we already identified that that was reaction number two and that's because they're looking for the words reduction is taking place there so reduction taking place it's very important that you explain to them that you actually know um, that this is your redox reasoning Okay, and in 4.3 it says, give a reason why the cell dies after delivering current for a while. Okay, guys, I'm sure you've all been there before. You've got your beautiful music player, you've got your torch or whatever might be the case. And uh, you're just sitting there and you're saying, okay, well, all right, it's playing nicely, playing nicely. And then all of a sudden it's not playing at all anymore. You start to notice that the music is not as loud and maybe it's even smart enough to give you a warning. Why does it die? Okay, well, you've got to remember that these chemicals run out. I will no longer have any zinc. I'll, my reducing agent, my oxidizing agent will run out. They'll transfer the electrons and they'll finish. The cell reaches what is known as equilibrium. You've heard that word before. You can say that the cell reaches equilibrium. So it reaches equilibrium by running out of reactants. Okay, now that means that there is no more energy trapped inside it. So it runs out of reactants. And that means that your redox can't take place anymore. And that's really important. Okay, so it's run out of reactants. It can't make any more electrons to power your torch or your MP3 player, whatever might be the case. And that's why it dies. Okay, so now we're on to the business end of this. We're talking about the redox. Now it says the EMF of the alkaline cell is 1.5 volts and that's generally the voltage of every pen light cell or double A battery. It says the maximum electrical work that can be done by the cell is 3 times 10 to the power of 4 joules. Now what we're going to do is we're going to calculate the cell capacity of this in amp hours. Okay, so now how do we actually calculate cell capacity in amp hours? Okay, now this is a little bit of a challenge. How on earth am I actually going to get this right? So now you've got to start digesting what the unit of amp hours really means. Okay, now it seems like they've actually given us a little bit of extra information and we might be asked about it a little bit later on. But this is going to get a little bit messy. Okay, now firstly before we go on, you've got to know what an amp hour actually is. An amp hour is usually from the equation that says that charge is equal to I times delta T. So let's just clean up my delta, otherwise it looks a little bit strange. Okay, so I've got Q is equal to I delta T. So I is in amps, understandably, and T, instead of being in seconds, it's in hours. Hmm, there's your first clue. 
So what I've got to do to change this into amp hours is I've got to realize that joules is actually somehow related to this. And I've got to say, okay, well, joules, which is my electrical energy and my voltage, hmm, this is all related. I have a voltage. I have work. How do I get charge? Okay, well, guys, it's all down to this equation. That voltage is equal to work over charge. So V is equal to W over Q. Now, which parts of this do I have? I've got the voltage of 1,5. I've got the work, but now this is in joules. This is going to be a little bit tricky. So this joules is 3 times 10 to the 4 joules. And that can give me the charge. But now the charge is not going to be in the correct units. I'm going to show you now why. Because when I work with volts and when I work with joules, we're going to be left with Q as amp seconds or coulombs. So now I'm going to show you how to work with coulombs in a second. So to get Q, what I need to do is to manipulate my calculation and say that 3 times 10 to the 4 joules divided by 1,5. And that's going to give me my charge in coulombs. So I'm going to take 3 times 10 to the power of 4, put it into my fraction, divided by 1.5, and I'm going to get 20,000 coulombs. OK, so 20,000 coulombs is not the answer which we're looking for. So it's 20,000 coulombs. But now, coulombs are actually something quite familiar. They are amp seconds. So how do you change amp seconds into amp hours? Well, it's quite easy to change seconds into hours. All I have to do is divide by 3,600, because that's how many seconds there are inside one hour. So let's change that just simply by dividing by 3,600. There we go. And I've got my answer there, 5,56 amp hours. OK, and that seems quite reasonable. 5,56 amp hours is around about right. That's fantastic. That's one of the units that I have to work with. Now, just a reminder that amp hours is not a standard unit. I only use it when I'm dealing with batteries. OK, now we're going to deal with the business end. How long can I keep my device on? The maximum constant current that this cell can deliver for 20 hours. Hmm. So I've got a time. I've got a time. That's delta T. What else do I have? I have Q. Well, the only equation which relates these and the one with our, which I'm looking off after is current. And Q is equal to I times T. Well, that's not too difficult to deal with now. I'm just looking for current. I've got my Q, but just a reminder that Q, when you're working with batteries, is measured in amp hours. Now, I want amp hours in there. So that's 5,56 amp hours. So you're not dealing with coulombs anymore. Now, the really nice thing about that is amp hours work very well with time, which is measured in hours as well. They've got to be compatible. They've got to be the same to work together. Now, what about my time over here? The time which I've got over here is 20 hours. So now, all I have to do is manipulate my equation. And I've got i is equal to 5,56. And I divide it by 20. And that gives me the time, sorry, not the time, but the current which comes through. So I've got 5,56. Now, it's actually more accurate to use the value which is already inside my calculator and divide that by 20. And my answer over there is a very small amount of current, so 278 milliamps or 0.27. So let's actually round it to 0.28 amps, so two decimal places there. So 0.28 Amps. So that's a very small amount of current for 20, uh, for 20 hours of operation. Guys, you've got to know these formulae. It's absolutely vital that you are absolutely okay with these different types of formulae. These formulae are slightly different for your battery calculations. You might notice as well, early on in this question, I was absolutely okay with all of the redox terminology. I knew what reduction and oxidation were, uh, what anodes and cathodes were. Guys, get into the past papers. I want you to be sitting with a fat stack 
of past papers when you're revising this. It's absolutely important that you're spending all of your time there because, guys, if you're serious about improving your science marks, that's where you should be spending your time. You should be doing two past papers a day, absolutely, and uh, climbing into that, asking your teacher some questions. There's a short amount of time before these finals, and past papers is a key. Some of you are making these beautiful mind maps and doing a revision and all of that. Don't spend too long on that. I know that you, it might make you feel good that you're doing lots of work, but guys, answer the questions. It'll make you feel familiar, you'll build up some confidence, and hopefully these ex exams will go very well for you. Okay, so chemical industries should be at the last part of your study list. It's at the end of your exam, and it's a smaller section. It's absolutely vital that you get ready by revising your maths and materials first, getting your organic in the bag. There's a section where you can score lots of marks. Chemical change, got to make sure that chemical change is absolutely okay before we even do chemical industries. And then only later on, chemical systems, which includes your batteries, your fertilizers, and your chloralkali. Guys, know the names, know the terminology, be absolutely prepared. Guys, I hope you, that you enjoyed our little revision session together. Hope that you're going to join us again, and you do very well in your finals. So practice hard, get those past papers, and get learning, guys.